her words are in the mouths of English men in Monte Carlo, Caribbean girls in paradise, Hollywood hotshots in the 50s, Irish bachelors in the 60s, Russians in the 1920s, and all kinds of Americans at the turn of the last century. Welcome to Women in Theater. I'm Linda Weiner, theater critic of Newsday. And our guest is Lynn Ahrens, the lyricist who, with composer Stephen Flaherty, has a Tony Award for their Americana score for Ragtime and London's Olivier for Trinidad Pop in Once on this Island. It's not the style of the piece, she has said, but the heart of the piece. And before we go on to trivial matters, I have one really, really important question to ask you. All right. What would you give for a Klondike bar? Oh, yes. Well, <laughs> <laughs> you delved very deeply into my past. Yes, yes. I, I am the voice and the writer of Klondike Bar. I was so yeah. impressed. Yes. I mean, musicals, sure. I know. But Klondike I know. Bar is in my head. I said, she did the single, the, 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 the jingle for Klondike Bar, and all night long, I couldn't get anything. Yep back in my mind. That would be me. But you know, there were many years where I supported myself doing jingles while yeah. I was trying to write theater. So that was my um, that was my flexible gig that I encourage young writers to find for themselves. It was very, very smart for yeah, you. Yeah, it was a good thing. It was good. But you actually didn't start out in theater at all, right? No, not at all. Not yeah. at all. I was a journalism major and um, a journalism <laughs> and literature major at Syracuse University. And I um, I thought that Jingles I Jingles will pay better. You know, yeah, right. well, I discovered that, but I, I didn't really know what I was going to do. But something in the field of writing, I ended up uh, in advertising uh, as an advertising copywriter for uh, seven years. And at the uh, latter part of that uh, time at the advertising agency, I, I segued into songwriting. They were producing Schoolhouse Rock, and I started writing for That's that. That's the ABC. Yeah, uh -huh, the animated show. show. I know, I know. Yeah. I feel like I should be on a walker at this yeah. point. You know, <laughs> kids come up. I love that show. So, But how, um, what, a, what a smart way to get into things. Of course, you hadn't planned it, but you were, um, you were a big deal at the advertising firm when you decided to go off and take, well, a, take a musical workshop. I, I, I don't, I wouldn't say I was a well, big deal, but I, I let you me know, do you, it. Let me do it. You were a big deal. Okay, right. I was a big deal. All right. No, well, yeah. I wasn't. I mean, I, I, you know, you get to a certain point in advertising, and everybody becomes a senior vice president. Everybody, mm -hmm. you know, if they can last long enough. So that's what I was. But I, I, uh, you know, I was doing Schoolhouse Rock, and I was um, uh, writing jingles, sort of on my own commercials at that point. And I thought I could perhaps be a freelance songwriter, and I quit. And um, the rest, you know, kind of fell into place. I, I started writing for television. I started writing for Captain Kangaroo. I, I was going to ask yeah. about the captain. Yes. Yeah, the captain. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll get to your real career, the honestly. Oh, I'm, it's okay. I'm, I'm, a... I'm regressing here. <laughs> so, um, and you, you, there was an Emmy. Mm -hmm. For um, for a young people show. Yeah, it was um, a show called H E L P, Doctor Henry's Emergency Lessons for People, and it was one of a series of drop-ins that I worked on. Um, drop-ins were these little short-form shows that go in betwixt and between the the full-length, um, you know, morning television shows, and uh, that one won an Emmy. I, I created it. I wrote it. I. Uh, produced it. I did the whole thing. So. So then you went in your total innocence. Uh, to and it to, was to it was. Uh, Lehman Angles BMI yes. music theater workshop. Yes, I, I had. I it just seemed to me that it was a uh, you know at a certain point I would I had started going to see a lot of theater, and um, my husband actually I have to say introduced me to the theater because growing this up in was New the husband at that time. No, my husband. The husband at yes, this time. Yes, he's I'm been sorry. around a long Thank time. You. Okay. This husband. Um, he. Um, he loved theater and still does love theater, and I had been exposed to very little of it uh, growing up, and um, even in college, I really never saw very much. And but you were born in New York, but then grew moved up to in New, New Jersey. Jersey, right? So mm -hmm. when I was in New York, I used to get taken to concerts and those sorts of things, but not much theater, and I think because my parents simply couldn't afford it. And um, once I started going. At the beginning, it never occurred to me that anyone wrote shows. I j they just were there, and I would admire the actors and have a great time. And suddenly, it dawned on me that somebody had written those words, and it was really uh, a thought that struck me. And uh, at that point, I'd heard about the uh, BMI workshop, and, and I thought, well, I've never tried that kind of writing. I've done jingles, and I've done commercials, and I've done children's television, but I've never done that. So I, I took it 
on a lark. And I remember um, sitting in there and suddenly going, oh, I should have been doing this all along. <laughs> <You know>? <laughs> oh, <laughs> so it was a, a door opened at that point. And towards the end of the session, towards the end of the series, mm -hmm. some guy came up to you and said, do you want to write a song together? That was uh, Schoolhouse Rock. Um, that was on Schoolhouse Rock because I was, I, uh, oh, oh, you're talking no, about I'm talking Steven. about that guy, that oh, guy that, that guy. Turned, out, turned into oh, that guy. your yes. lifelong collaborator. Yes, yes, he did. He, uh, Stephen Flaherty, uh, who's been my partner for, I don't even know how many years now, probably 20 something, um, was in my class and he was writing his own lyrics at the time and his own music. And I always looked at him and thought, oh, he's so talented and he's, just this self-contained entity. He doesn't need anybody but himself. He was really wonderful. And at the end of that first year, when I had been, uh, you know, kind of dating a lot of other different composers, he approached me, and I guess he had admired my work from afar as well, and and he um, invited me to write a song with him. And and I just never looked back. It was a it was an amazing experience. He just put his now, hands down. And this assignment was to write a song, two people in two different locations doing the same thing? Two, uh, two people in different locations basically singing the same song, yeah. yes. I love the craft things, I love yes, how this, it's yes. a simple craft thing, you know, on a stage there's somebody standing here and on a bare stage, but you imagine they're in a bedroom and here they're standing on a bare stage and you imagine they're somewhere else, and that was the assignment to learn how to write that sort of song, and we wrote um, a song about two people writing sending in personal ads to the Village Voice and, um, you know, having things in common and things not in Which common. Which in 1983 and people did because there did. wasn't an there internet. There was no internet, right, exactly. Right. That's how old that song is. <laughs> and it wasn't a very good song, I have to say, but the collaboration was really, really interesting and fun. And you just clicked right away and you Right away, right away, yeah. Writing yeah. a lot of musicals that nobody produced. Yeah, well actually we wrote um, probably three that nobody produced, which isn't so many, but you know, each one, we, we worked very long and hard on a show called Bedazzled, which um, has a, 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 I guess, a little bit of history to it, because we could never get the rights, but you know, everyone kept saying, oh, oh, you should do the show, you should do the show, and we could never get the rights to that. Then we wrote a show called Antler with George with Wolf. With George Wolf, I want mm -hmm. to ask, you wrote a, a, yeah. a musical about South Dakota yes. with George Wolfe. Can you now, believe I, it? I'm saying look at the different voices <laughs> with know. which you are writing. But I know. George Wolfe in South Dakota and the mu musical was called Antler. Hard to imagine. I know. I'd give a lot to see that. I right know. Now. Yeah. Uh, it was. Um, what would you pay me to not see it? Yes. Yeah. All right. Well, <laughs> a <laughs> lot. I think it, George is so wonderful, and I don't. Th it really was not his cup of tea. But but you know, the, it was the, the idea of it was that all these very very different people come from the city to po populate this little town in called Antler in South Dakota, and it actually was based on a real. Uh, event a farmer was giving away free land, so we thought, well, <laughs> sounds good. And um, at that point, we were under the mentorship and of uh, a fellow named Ira Weitzman at Playwrights Horizons, who had um, been involved in George's early work there and our early work. And um, very important put in us, the development yeah. of serious musical yeah. theater. Yeah, and he put us together, and you know we love George to this day. But <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> he's doing his own thing. And you know. so the first show that really got a lot of attention was Lucky Stiff. Yes, although it wasn't our first produced show. Okay. Our first produced show was The Emperor's New Clothes for Theatre Works USA, which was a one hour um, show for young audiences, and it was a fantastic experience, really fantastic. They commissioned us, and that was our first you know, professional theater experience. And to see your show in front of a thousand screaming children you know, at Town Hall, teaches you so much about what's working and what isn't working and learning to read an audience and learning that, you know, I mean, even to this day, you know, I can look at an audience and I and I know they're all just really children underneath. And, you know, when they're looking at their programs or the, their watches, you know, children scream and get up and run up the aisle, but adults yeah. do it in, in a more subtle way. And it was, it was a wonderful experience. Yeah. And then we did Lucky Stiff. And you have, I mean, here's the two of you who have really done a number of major musicals, yeah. uh, including Ragtime, Once on This Island, the My Favorite Year, you know, a lot of very interesting projects. Some of them work better than others, right. and um, Susical, and and my personal favorite, A Man of No Importance, right. and 
And yet people really don't know you guys. I don't know how it is that you've managed this neat trick because people, you know, everyone knows the entire genealogy of, of um, Adam Gittle and everybody knows where these new songwriters came from. And the two of you sort of, sort of work under the radar and yet have made a real contribution to, to a, a sort of offbeat but commercial right. musical. Right. How does that happen? Well, I think it's a number of things. Um, one, I read somewhere, I, I, I don't even remember where, but um, they called us and I believe Bill Finn uh, the lost generation. Oh. We're sort of, we fell into the cracks between, you know, the, the Sondheim and, and John mm. Kander and Fred and, and Richard Maltby and all those guys. And, and in between the cracks of Adam and, um, you know, whoever else, Michael yes. John Lacusa and, yeah. you know, all Janine those, Tesori. Janine and all those people. And we're sort of right in the middle mm -hmm. and we're bridging, we're bridging in a certain way. And so that's one thing. Um, and th the other thing is I think that Stephen and I tend to be very low profile people. Yeah. We don't, uh, um, have any problems? Knock on wood. You know. <laughs> don't. We, I'm I know, sorry. We're really Our time don't. is up. I have no problems. I know we're not neurotic, <laughs> yeah. particularly. You know, and yeah. we sort of just do our work, and um, don't worry too much about publicity or uh, uh, you know all of that stuff. So you know, I mean, and, and in a way, I, I, I far prefer that. Um, well, as a lyricist. You know, I mean, we can hear a Sondheim, for example, right. lyric, and know that's a Sondheim lyric. Right. Um, you have said that if you've done your job correctly, you are invisible. I'm invisible. You've, you've hidden in the character. That's right. I think Which Sondheim, is a different philosophy, right? It, well, I think Sondheim probably d tries to do that too, you know, and he, <laughs> he just can't shut up. Right? Well, no, he's so amazing yeah. that, you know, his, his, um, his soul pours into the kinds of characters that he writes, you know, and, and it just comes out in this amazing way uh, that I don't think anybody can duplicate. And if you try to duplicate it, you're doomed, you know. So yeah, you get on that list know. at a little Sondheim list. Yeah, yes. yeah. Um, we haven't done that, thank no. God. We, we've tried consciously not to. But I, I think, yeah, I like to be invisible. I, I, I've written for so many crazy characters, you know, from you know, black piano players, men, uh, to, to, to gay men in the 60s, to, to women, you know, in, in the 1840s. Um, I, I, none of them sound like Lynn Aarons. They all sound like themselves, you know. And none of them sound really like Flaherty either. Right. I mean, you guys do not have a kind of musical. You know, you, this, right. That's you right. are chameleons. You're so versatile. Now, yeah. does this sometimes hurt or is it always a help? Um, I don't think we could do it any other way, so I don't know. But um, I do think that we have, a, there's a certain something, and if you look at our work beginning probably, probably with Lucky Stiff and coming to the present, there is a certain, I think there are certain similarities that you can find and certain consistencies, and one of them is a, 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 um, a transparent voice, I think. I like to think that anyway, that, you know, we communicate well. We don't try to obscure things. We're not... Uh, we don't try consciously to be fancy or artful or, um, you know, we just try to really make the characters and make the music speak from the heart. And I think that that's a common uh, a given. You know, it's, a, it's I mean, if it, it's a sort of an Oscar Hammerstein-ish philosophy, I, I suppose, which is to really, um, you know, put forth something honest. Yeah, get and, the hell out of the way. And get the hell out of the way, that's yeah. right, yeah, yeah. I, I can't do, you know, triple rhymes. I mean, I can. Yes. I just don't. I choose uh -huh. not to. Because um, I don't think you know it's it's too fancy. Mm -hmm. Do you think? Uh, are you a quick study? Are you are you you're fast, right? Pretty fast. Bleeder? Do you bleed? Do I bleed? Yeah. I mean, you know, <laughs> do you do you rewrite and rewrite and rewrite? Oh, um, I do. I'm a bleeder. This is I, what do. I do. Oh, I know. Okay. Yeah. Yes, I do. I yeah. do. I, I I'm very fast, and then I rewrite and rewrite and uh -huh. rewrite. Yeah. And how different is it when? You come up with a project. You prefer to do adaptations, actually, and and you read. Yeah, you yeah. actually literally read. I do. Yeah. You read novels and you find projects that appeal to you mm -hmm. and, and and work on adaptations, um, which then would come out of your own choice. How different is that from having being asked to be one of many composer lyricist teams to audition uh, for the job at Ragtime? 
That was interesting. <laughs> but I had read Ragtime many times before we were invited to compete on that um, process. You know, we, we, we were uh, we were asked, I think there were seven or eight other teams also asked, and everybody was competing to, to be chosen as the uh, composer lyricist team for this show. And I don't know that that's ever been done. That was one of, uh, it was just a very unique uh, situation. And, um, but having read the book of Ragtime and uh, actually having been in the process of looking for a new show and wanting to do something Americana, um, Stephen was just knew he had a great American musical in him, and really we were looking for that kind of material. So when it uh, was offered to us to, you know, audition, we we felt we had to do it. We just had to do it, and we killed ourselves <laughs> to, you know, present something and and submit something that we thought would would uh, be did great. Did you tape it, or did you come in yeah. with your tap shoes, or you know? No, no. <laughs> uh, although I could be heard doing I've a few cameos. <laughs> I've I've seen too many movies. Yeah. yeah no, yeah. we've we've done that. Oh. No, we 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 did four demos, and uh -huh. uh, we called in all our friends, uh, all our singer friends, and said, please come. We have you know ten days to deliver this thing, and please come and sing. And we got studio time, and we did some beautiful demos and and uh, three of the four songs that we did stayed in the show and how different is it to have worked with someone with a someone who was actually a kind of impresario mm -hmm. right I mean yeah a uh, Darth Drabinsky, Garth Drabinsky who mm -hmm. considered himself some sort of Diaghilev I guess and he would just he could put these projects together yeah. and they would be a reflection of him as yeah. opposed to it coming out the other you know from from the creative team themselves uh, that must be very different from, for example, working with Andre Bishop and from Playwrights Horizons right. to Lincoln Center, where you've had, where you've had a theater that basically supported your work. That's right. It's a completely different thing, but both very valid uh -huh. in a certain way. Um, you know, we've worked at Lincoln Center a number of times with Andre Bishop and Bernie Gersten and Ira Weitzman. They're amazing. They completely stay out of your way. They don't even come into the rehearsal room until they're invited. Uh, they give very careful, gentle, and sensitive comments. Uh, and they're really more like questions than comments. You know, that I have a question here, and have you thought of this? And they're so amazing to writers. Mm -hmm. uh, they respect your process, and really, they're doing your show because they believe in your work, and it's not about succeeding or failing as much as supporting writers. And, and that's uh, just been a yeah. gift to us over the years. I mean, it's clear it's from in the audience. Amazing, yeah. 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 Garth Drabinsky is it was a whole other experience, but also fantastic. Yeah. I mean, we had at the beginning. Yes, it was his idea to do Ragtime, um, and he brought that to us, and we embraced the project, and you know, became very proprietary about it, and felt that it was ours, and we loved it just as much as he did. His he began at the beginning trying to direct us what to write, mm -hmm. and we don't work like that, you know, because yeah. we self-generate so yeah. many. Do the projects. two of you work? Um, you know, this is the this is the process question. Yeah, you know, chicken or egg? Which one are you? Either or. Uh huh. Either or. Uh, we get in the same room together. We talk about everything a lot. Sometimes Stephen will put his hands on the keys and come up with a tune, and sometimes I'll write a few words, and it'll. Do you sing and dance around the room? Yes. I heard that. Yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> and I do all the voices. I heard that. I do and all the voices. The room. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. But Garth, I, I just to finish the, yeah. what I was going to say about Garth was that. Um, at the beginning, he was trying to tell us what to write, and we had a big blow up over it. And um, I said, you know, you can ask us, you can ask questions, and you can voice your concerns about things that you don't feel are working, and you can tell us that you're confused, and we will address anything that you, you, you know, say in that regard. But please don't try to give us solutions. Mm -hmm. And once we established the parameters, it was like working on any other musical. Mm -hmm. Uh, and he was tremendously respectful of us. Is there a, is there an untold story still to be told about ragtime? Um, I'm sure there are about a okay. hundred. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I don't know okay. that I want to tell them. Was now. there a revisionist ragtime in London? E well, slightly. It was the same text. Yeah. Pretty much the same text, but it was done uh, scenically. The production was tremendously different. It, you know, in, in on Broadway, it was the biggest, most lavish. Everything mm -hmm. that Garth did was big and lavish. Huge sets and fireworks and, you know, the works. Beautiful looking. Gorgeous. Yeah. 
And on, bro on uh, the West End, uh, we had a wonderful young director named Stafford Arima who paired all that away. There were sets and there were costumes, but it was very, very simple. And he had a motif of black chairs. And he, so Evelyn Nesbitt's swing was a black chair mm. that men, you know, swung. And, and the black chair was turned around and became the railing of the ship. And uh, it, two of them together became the Model T. And it worked magnificently. And it made you realize that the show that had worked so well in a workshop situation on a plain bare wood floor, you know, could work without anything. Do you do a lot of research in order to to find out? You must to get yeah. to these styles because these are these are um, these are archival in many ways. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I do. I do a lot of reading uh -huh. um, of you know, for instance, with Ragtime, I read Emma Goldman's uh -huh. uh, biography, and I read um, oh, you know, I just read anything. I you know even. Uh, pieces about women's clothing, the corseting, and, and all of that. But when all is said and done, uh, I think really what um, what I what helps me the most is the source material. If it's mm -hmm. rich source material, which Ragtime certainly was. Now you sometimes write the book. Yeah. Um, and s many of your other ones, several several have been with uh, the librettist is Terence McNally. Right. Right. How important is it to find? another person whose sensibilities you can share. You know, it's... it's I, if you're out there, yeah, <laughs> yeah. call me up. Uh, it's very important, and yeah. it's very hard. And some, you know, lyricists are in a very, very tricky position because, you know, playwrights aren't always good book writers and don't always want to write book. Mm -hmm. um, so to find someone like a Terence McNally, who is so generous and will write these magnificent scenes and um, uh, monologues, and then I just take his work and turn it into a lyric, and you know, kind of steal his thunder. Um, it's it's fabulous when you can find someone like How that. How frustrating, though, to be the book writer because I I've heard them complain, and I think it's true. Uh, guilty, Your Honor, uh, that if the book works, you sort of don't mention it. That's right, and if it and if mm -hmm. the show isn't working. You can blame the book writer. That's always the case. Yes. You know, there's no percentage in this. That's right. That's right. That's why. Yeah. That's why they're hard to find. Because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they'd be fools to do this. But you I know, some of them see this. Love yeah. the process, and and really, you know, that's what it's about. But that's absolutely true. Yeah. How. How frustrating, and annoying, it must be. Let me put words in your mouth. Um, the, to have Broadway, so much of Broadway being turned into jukebox musicals now. It's a little frustrating. Yeah, um, it is. Yeah. There you have it. <laughs> it's, um, but they're great songs. Uh, if people can weave them together artfully, you know, and make some money, more power to them. It's just that it's, uh, you know, creating a different atmosphere and a different kind of audience on Broadway when, where people want to arrive already knowing the songs. And it just makes it that much harder for us. But And all the craft you know, that, all the, the craft that you've developed through your workshops and how to write in different voices yeah. for different artists and how to make transitions and stuff. These pop guys, you know, did what they did. Right. And we love them for it. Mm -hmm. But, and then there's no transitions and you just sort of well, maybe them the, together, yeah. uh, but it may be over. Maybe the Who book knows? writers are getting their revenge. Uh, <laughs> you know, just, <laughs> that's right. You don't want our books? Yeah, you don't right. Well, we'll weave the other songs yeah, together. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you've, you're very good with children. I don't know. Do you have children? I don't have children. Okay. No. And, um, and you live with this husband, and you're no longer in the in downtown in a loft? No, we okay, moved. I'm we just relocated. Trying to catch up on your <laughs> yes, we grew up uh, on your, <laughs> your your scenery. You're set. You're set. Yeah. And um, and and you're what a dozen years older than than um, than Stephen Flaherty. Yes, but who's counting? You um, know. Yeah. 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 So, and he's sort of from the Midwest and conservatory trained. And you were born in New York for, and, and, and Jersey. Yeah, and Jersey was girl. Ouija, the photographer, really your babysitter? Uh, he was a really close friend of my father's. <laughs> and uh, yes, I, I don't, I, I think he and his, his um, uh, wife um, did babysit me, yes. And I do remember being carried by Ouija. Yeah. So, how does this, these sensibilities, it's really quite remarkable that you've come together and created something. Yeah. That goes out of both of yourselves yeah. into so many other things. Yeah, I don't know the answer to yeah. that. I just, um, I we have a very similar sense of humor, Stephen and I. We have a very kind of a grounded sense of, um, dare I say, not morality, but you know, we we sort of have this, a similar sense of wrong and right and what we what we um, 
what we feel about things. And, Be and gentle then, but honest and decaffeinated coffee only. Yes, now. Those are the rules. That's right. Basic. That's right. Where did you get that okay. from? <laughs> so, um, we, our time is running out, and I hate okay. that. Uh, I just wonder, is there something that we should know about future productions, um, or would you like to keep it to yourself? Um, uh, well, I sort of would like to keep it to myself. I understand but uh, I will say one thing that we're doing, which is really fun, is we're rewriting my favorite year. Um, and we love the show, and it didn't quite work, but a lot of it did. And we ha are back with our book writer. We have revamped it, and um, we're, we're doing that, and that's really fun. And then we have two new projects uh, coming up, uh, both of which we're, I think we're going to develop at Lincoln Center, two beautiful new pieces, and, um, you know, onward. Oh, well. Wow. Yeah. Thank you so much. It's Thanks. been just a pleasure to get to know Same you. Same to you. Lynn Ahrens. <laughs> Thanks, and Lynn. And thank you for joining us. On behalf of the League of Professional Theatre Women, I'm Linda Weiner, and this has been Women in Theatre. <laughs>